This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. How Blue Jays are aiding habitat recovery on Santa Cruz Island. Practical research in developing sustainable farming practices. But first, how does a single mom computer novice far from home become a software engineer at Google? Plus, a very smart puppy and some furry friends. All on this edition of On Beyond. Meet Anuparevi Muparti, or Anu for short, alumna of UC San Diego's Computer Science and Engineering Department, and a front-end engineer at what is universally regarded as the heart of visionary tech, Google. But mostly, she is a person you will not forget. So, I have to tell you the story first. Um, I was an intern at Amazon, Seattle, uh, five years ago, and I was given housing in this Skyrise building, Aspira. And in the middle of the night, there was a fire alarm that went off. And I had this five-year-old girl and three-year-old boy. And of course, I had to take all these stairs. Guess what I first picked up? My backpack that had my laptop. And then I'm shoving this hard drive into it. Why? Because it has the photos of my kids since they were born. Like every month, at the end of the month, I upload May 2007, June 2007. And I put that on my backpack, pick both those kids up and, and run down the stairs. I don't worry about the hard drive anymore. I work on Google Photos. It's like this photos and videos service provided by Google. It's to store and to share. There are three components to it. Uh, part one is the actual storage, where, you, where the auto-backed up photos that you take on your phone, these countless of photos, and they're all backed up automatically, and they're all like in a safe place. Nobody's looking at them unless I give them permission to. Um, I always have them. They could be a fire alarm. My phone could be lost. I, I still have my photos in a safe place. So that's part one. Part two, searching. I don't have to go through this infinite scroll. Hold on, in 2006 in Hawaii, I was wearing this blue hat and I don't have to do that anymore. Just enter that Google, the search king, the search queen. So just enter your words and then all the pictures of me wearing a, a blue hat in Hawaii in 2007 or whatever it is show up. It's easy to search, easy to share. And then you're like, okay, I want to share this, 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 this with my mom and these with my professor, these with my friend. So that's the second component, the searching and sharing. And the third component is, yes, you have your photos and they're all your memories and you hold on to them and you can share them. You still want to be surprised. So it's, it's nice, like, you get this card once, once in a while saying, hey, do you remember what you were doing five years ago? You were here doing this. Or look how, old, how much older your kids are now. Like, look how much they've grown. So there's these um, magical movies that are made, auto videos that are made, these collages that are made. So that's the third component. So I work on the desktop side. So whatever the user sees, when you go to photos.google.com, the photos grids and, the, and you can select, you can see all the albums, you can see all the photos, you can see all the settings. All that is basically what my team works on. I'm also one of its biggest fans. So it's, it's nice that I work on a, on a product that's so user facing. So when I explain to people it back home to my father or something, I don't have to talk in abstract terms. You know, when, I, when this happens and it goes faster and you can't see it, none of those. It's like, this is what I work on. Bring out the phone. You see these buttons? I make those buttons happen. And when you click, so, yeah, I work on Google Photos and I, I, I love it. The path to her Google career was not typical, or as one might imagine, the path that device-savvy, gaming-saturated youngsters long adept at Scratch and Minecraft would follow. Um, I grew up in India, uh, in a city called Hyderabad. Uh, my, my parents were separated when I was little. Um, I've, I'm, I'm very close to my father. He's, 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 I don't know, it's a cliche, like he's my mentor, my friend, my advisor. He was not an engineer, uh, but he did love math. And uh, every, every time I lost a point in one of my math tests, he would put me to shame. He'd say, okay, what happened? None of my uh, upbringing was related to CS directly, but there was this problem-solving mindset. Like, 
looking at something and then breaking it down like this modular way of thinking where I'm like okay so this I can break it down into the six pieces and then this piece looks like piece two from that one and then like being able to see patterns and putting them together so that's exactly programming too when I think of it just building blocks of an if statement and a while loop and these variables and things like that so I guess I did have that form of thinking the logical way and like trying to solve a problem and trying to break it down and trying to look for patterns but it was not like very computer science specific in any way but the engineering mindset was was in place I, I don't think I was prepared in any way for a field in computer science on day one at UCSD. I think, I think my son, my nine-year-old, knows a lot more about computer science at that point of time when I joined UCSD. So computer science-wise, I did not know anything. And when I did enroll at UCSD, I went through this huge imposter syndrome. I, I still do, even now. It's like, I am at the wrong place. These people are so much smarter. And they, they've played with computers their entire life. I did not have the luxury to make school a priority at that point of time. Um, I was a single mom. I had two kids under the age of three. I had no family here in the US. Um, not anyone I could count on, not even a distant cousin. And classes were not like a nine to five. You'd, had, you'd have class at 6 p.m., you'd have class at 7 p.m. And what do you do with two kids? So I would frequently go to classes with my kids, one in a sling and one in tow. Um, I've been in situations where um, I've had a three-month-old in a baby beyond with me and um, the kid was being fussy and the class, I think I was maybe one of the, uh, the only one, uh, the only girl in the class, if not one of two. And um, I would, the, the door, it was a glass door, so I would sit outside the classroom and while I nursed my son, I would let's just copy down whatever the professor was writing on the board with no idea what he was saying. Then I'd go home and read over the book and then look at my notes and oh, so this makes sense and this is what he was trying to explain. So transcribe my own notes. So, um, yeah, I, I, it was, looking back, I think it was, it was an interesting time. And uh, I was the one who had those kids like sleeping on a blanket in the lab while I'm coding like at 12 p.m. or at 1 a.m. So there were so many days I wanted to give up. I, unlike others, I, I did not see, I did not dream of a future five years from now. I, I, survival was my only thing. I'm like, okay, today is done, tomorrow will be a new day. So I don't think I would have bet on myself uh, with two kids or taking a voucher to get a carton of milk. Um, but someone did bet on her and she went on to earn both her bachelor's and master's degrees from UC San Diego. She shares about the special role the computer science and engineering department played in her success, the place it occupies in her heart, and what it means to her future. I did not have a family right when I was here, so tutors were my family. There are these bonds that are formed among those groups. There was this comfort and the support and the encouragement that you get, and so people wanted to be tutors. And once you're a tutor, you're just, it's like this googliness in Google, right? It's not something that you can touch, but yet it exists, the, the myth of googliness. You just, you just want to be better, and you want to leave the world in a better state than it was for having you in it. I, I don't think I would, have, I would be what I am if I did not, if I wasn't a tutor, or if I did not have a TA family. They, they held me up. There were days when I would like, I cannot do this anymore and they had this hand behind me saying yes you can and we're all there to cheer you and sometimes it was harsh talk oh come on you can do it or or sometimes it was like I know it's hard but you can still do it those those that was important and then though this is also the tangible support the the student advisors on the first floor they're rock stars you go to them with a problem and then you go again four months later and they would ask so how's is this okay or is it still happening or like they bonded with you and and that helps you're not just a number you were a person and then the professors I have walked into professors rooms and dropped a kid in front of them telling them can you please give them a piece of paper and pen I'll be back I'm gonna go take a quiz and I'll be back and they were sure who does that I had professor Victor Viano tell me you have a test tomorrow. My daughter can babysit your kid if you want. She's a good girl. She's 13 or 14 or maybe even a little older, but she's a good girl. Who says that? He's a professor. 
He has so many awards. I was his TA. He owes me nothing. I strongly believe that our department is unique and the school is, the, the, the CSE is awesome, the department at, at UCSD. They've taught me to realize what I know and to also realize what I do not know. It's important to know what I don't know because unless I know that, I wouldn't know to A, look for resources or B, ask for help or C, try to learn. So that was the biggest thing that UCSD uh, taught me, like to differentiate what you know, what you do not know. And when you do not know, what do you do? How to be resourceful. And that's exactly what's transferred here. I haven't stopped learning a single day. There's never a day I go to work saying, I know it all and I'm gonna like code it. So as I'm driving, I'm still like, huh, how, maybe I could have thought of it this way. How else could I have done it? So as long as I have that learning curve every day, I think I'm gonna stay in Google Photos. If, if I do end up at Google 10 years from now, I'd still like to be able to learn, be able to go to work feeling excited and leave work thinking that I've learned something new today, every single day. I'd like to teach someday. I'd like to teach computer science someday. Not today, but perhaps 10 years from now, I'd like to be teaching. Either it would be, a, I'm, a, I'm working for Google and teaching. Perhaps that will lend me some credibility when I'm teaching. Or, uh, or perhaps I'm just teaching full time, but I'd like to teach computer science. Um, to help people realize that this is an awesome field and that it's so powerful. Anu's atypical path to success offers unique insights. What advice does she have for women, especially those like her who never dreamed of this career? So women pursuing computer science. I was never conscious of the fact that I'm a girl, so I should not be good at math. Or it's acceptable for me to be a little behind in math or things like that. So there was this um, encouraging fact from my dad, like he never let me be, uh, sell myself short because I was a girl. Do not give up because of your gender or because of your back. I, I, I could do it. I mean, any person in the world could do it now. Women do tend to hesitate more to make a mistake. And it's okay to make mistakes. Computer science, it's like, it's so easy. You just, it's, it's programming. You can, you can always fix it. They're always fix it. Um, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Do not be afraid to question, to ask. Like, chances are the others are gonna be happy that you ask that question. So, and don't confuse experience with smartness. Like when I joined Google, I was like, these people are so smart. And, and they are, they are very smart. But they also have had experience. They've been here for like three years or four years. So um, women tend to go through more of the imposter syndrome. So I say, don't do that. Stick with it. Stick with the program. Go through it. It's, there's this, to, for success, there's this hard work times determination times knowledge. Like there are many factors that help, right? So if you're lacking in knowledge, it's okay. Your hard work will help. And then you, increase or decrease them and then um, you will succeed. The other thing that I'm gonna, uh, that I would recommend uh, women is form study groups, form bonds, form, make allies. They don't have to be all women. And it helps to initially get your voice. Learn, 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 learn. Ask people, read books, ask for help, ask questions. So I would say, yeah, stick with it. The world is so much more different now than it was 10 years ago. There's, the companies are realizing the importance of women in tech and they provide daycares, maternity leaves. So the world is trying to meet you too. Then don't give up, keep moving. Anu never stopped moving, never gave up. Though she never dreamed she would be where she is. And she reflects on what and who helped her get here. I never saw myself at Google and I did it because of UCSD CSC. It doesn't matter if I was smart or if I was hardworking, I, I could not have done it without UCSD CSC. These are real people and, and they want the students to succeed. They want us to do well. If anything, they rejoice in your successes and they do not laugh at your failures. They think, what can we do to help you? There are innumerable people that I could thank. I hope they know who they are. And, and I hope they know that I carry a piece of their advice and their encouragement with me every day. And I hope they still feel proud of me. And I'm gonna try to do what I can to make sure they do feel that way. And that's it. Recovery of the oak chaparral is one of the big signs of habitat recovery.
across the Channel Islands, the island scrub jays, uh, Aphylacoma insularis, may be catalyzing that recovery. They are different from the mainland cousins in the fact that they are larger in size, uh, more mass, and they're also more dramatic in their color patterns. So the blacks are darker, the blues are more intense. In the 40 years that this island has been part of the UC Reserve System, we've seen it uh, go through many changes in the ecological processes out here. Uh, the, the disturbance by non-native vertebrates was slowly removed, and since then we've witnessed this amazing recovery of the ecosystem. Right now I'm studying a process that may have been crucial to that regeneration. The seed dispersal process, which brings one of the main vegetation players back to where it used to be. There's a big interest in what the jays do with the acorns and how their habitat preferences when hiding seeds affect the distribution of oaks in the future. It's how far a jay is willing to go with an acorn affect the distribution of oaks. Like most corvids, they scatter hoard seeds. So they like to take seeds from a tree, fly with them and hide them in the ground, which serves as food storage for times of food scarcity. And it's kind of a trick how the trees get their seeds out into the landscape. They hide up to five, 6,000 seeds per season. And when the winter isn't that bad or an animal forgets some of the seeds, the acorns that stay in the ground are effectively dispersed. There are several advantages to a place like Santa Cruz Island to a reserve. The island provides us with a simplified dispersal system so that many other players and the mainland system are absent here. So we don't have squirrels, we don't have other scatter hoarding corvids. We are provided with the infrastructure that allows us to access these places. So we need housing, we need places to store our equipment. I'm just incredibly thankful that this resource is being conserved and, and valued for what it is. Smart puppy. What, kitties? What's a superconductor? A superconductor is a material that carries electricity with no resistance at all. Huh? What's resistance? It's like this. In a regular conductor, electrons are always bumping into each other, going different directions, and getting lost along the way. But in a superconductor, they all march together in the same direction. I get it. All the electrons get to where they're supposed to go and don't get lost along the way. You got it, kitties. That's what makes a superconductor. We are in the middle of a little strawberry patch here, and students are picking the strawberries. It's a Wednesday morning, and in about an hour or so, the Davis Campus Farmer's Market will be starting, and we will be selling these organic strawberries and a bunch of other produce that we have. Each quarter, up to 60 students at the University of California, Davis, work or volunteer at the Four Acre Market Garden, where they learn basic organic farming skills. Some of these students hope to start farming operations of their own someday. Others are interested in soil science or even seed genetics. But all are aware of the pressing need to find new ways to farm more efficiently. There's a growing population. We're going to need to figure out how to produce food in a sustainable way to feed all of those people. Um, and it's not just agriculture, it's food access, it's health, it's nutrition, it's all of those things. In 2010, nearly 15% of American households, or 48.8 million people, at some point didn't know where they'd get their next meal. It's called food insecurity, and it's on the rise. At the same time, the United Nations predicts that our global population will hit 9 billion people by the year 2050. And while it will be a challenge to grow enough nutritious food, it could also be a challenge to find and educate enough farmers to meet the demand, as an overwhelming number of them are close to retirement. To top it off, agriculture has a considerable environmental footprint. 
pressing researchers to find ways to reduce the effects of farming while increasing the amount of food produced. The challenges and the opportunities that we have around sustainable agriculture going into this current century are about how do we provide food, but how do we do it in a way that is good for the environment and good for people not only now, but, but you know, forever into the future. Sustainability, that's what it comes down to. The ability to produce more food more efficiently while also caring for the land. It's such a pressing issue that in 2011, UC Davis added a new major called Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems, focused on teaching the social, economic, and environmental impacts of agriculture. A few years earlier, in 2007, the university launched the Agricultural Sustainability Institute, which includes a 20-acre student farm and a long-term research facility called Russell Ranch. The idea is to be a hub for all of our activities in research, education, and outreach about agriculture and sustainability. And the mission is really to ensure the vitality of agriculture today and for future generations to come in California. All organic, market garden, ecological garden, my house. Mark Van Horn is the director of the student farm, which includes the market garden as well as an ecological garden and a children's garden, where an estimated 50,000 youngsters have learned about agriculture over the years. Go ahead and pinch this stem and then pull with your other hand. Children that get involved in growing healthy food are more interested in eating healthy food. If they grow things in the garden, they want to eat them, they want to share them with their families. Van Horn says getting younger people interested in agriculture will lead to increased awareness of the challenges farmers are facing and the importance of knowing where your food comes from. Many agree that society is more removed from their food sources than ever before, but also more interested in how and where it's grown. And they always sell out. Everybody loves our strawberries. That has resulted in the field to fork movement and the focus on sustainability. At UC Davis, it has meant growing interest in agriculture from students like Kaylee Winston Corrin, who moved here from Los Angeles. I feel like people from where I'm from don't farm or really think about where their food comes from. It's kind of humbling, like working here and seeing the effort that gets put into making our food. Should I just rinse that off? Yes. Yeah, give it a little squirt with the hose. Students here help live the field to fork concept by planting, growing, harvesting, and delivering produce that is then served on campus, sold at the farmer's market, and distributed to faculty and staff through community-supported agriculture boxes. Are these bags ready to go? I think so. Okay. Very briefly, in 12 words or less, describe what your system is. But creating the next generation of ag experts who can tackle the many issues involved in farming today... How should we kind of approach this? ...is a complex matter, one that's overshadowed by a growing population and shrinking number of farms and farmers. I'm actually moving to D.C. I'm hoping to do food policy or food access work for a little bit. Genevieve Lapari is one of the first students to graduate from the new Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems major and is planning a career in agriculture, just not the type you typically would think of. From agribusiness to finance to politics, the food system touches many parts of our lives and our economy and requires many different skill sets. An estimated 200 careers today involve agriculture. I think that if you really want to make change, especially in the food system and in a lot of aspects in our world, that you really do need an interdisciplinary sort of approach. It's a system of problems, so you need a systems approach to solving them. One approach can be found here at UC Davis's Russell Ranch. It's a unique 300-acre long-term research facility that's dedicated to comparing different farming practices and discovering which methods are most sustainable. So we're comparing organic, which um, has inputs of manure and cover crop as sources of fer fertility and doesn't use synthetic um, pesticides. We have conventional, which uses synthetic fertilizer inputs and does use pesticides. And then we also have a, a system that's in between. We call it a mixed system. So you're a little short compaction though. Three centimeters you don't ever worry about. They're measuring things like yield and profitability, soil property, greenhouse gas emissions, water, and use of fertilizers and pesticides. All have faced some level of controversy and will require extensive research to find answers. 
At Russell Ranch, that research will span 100 years. It's called the Century Project, and it's currently in year 18. Is this the fertilizer in here? It's in here. It's liquid fertilizer, and um, this little pump pumps it into the line. And this line, that's where the water is flowing to irrigate the tomatoes. Drip irrigation allows less water to be used, creates no runoff, and the fertilizer goes directly to the plant. Considering water quality and quantity is a growing concern, a lot of his focus is on farming methods that will use it more efficiently, with less harm to the environment. Our main finding was uh, that we have less uh, greenhouse gas emissions on the drip with drip irrigation. These findings are still in their infancy, but will hopefully lead to farming practices that both increase yield, enough to feed 9 billion people, and protect our planet. Planting hedgerows and wildflower strips in these areas. Kate Scow knows better than most the challenges in feeding a growing population. She's done extensive work with farmers in Uganda who face extreme food shortages and poor farming conditions. She acknowledges the need for a variety of experts to work together to truly improve sustainability. There's a, a strong international focus at, at Davis and people have been working for, for many years throughout the world. Nobody can be the, the single-handed Lone Ranger sustainability expert. It's all about being able to work with other people in teams to create solutions. It's a belief that's shared by students as well as faculty. A lot of the papers that I find when I do my research come out of UC Davis. Graduate student Graham Savio is majoring in international agricultural development and sees the potential for fixing the food system in the ability to share knowledge both at UC Davis and abroad. I'm heading to East Africa, so I'm, I'm going to work with farmers there and work with identifying farmers who are already being really successful. Even those farmers who have found success are also likely to find increasing sustainability challenges in the years ahead. Challenges that include water supply, pest control, climate change and energy. There are issues that have the potential to dramatically change our environment and our ability to feed 9 billion people. If we're talking about increasing food production by another 70 or 100 percent over the next two generations, I don't think business as usual is going to get us to where we need to be. I think we have uh, an enormous challenge uh, lying ahead. We already are, are coming up with better ways of managing nutrients, managing water, and we have a challenge and, and I think we're going to meet it. It means that uh, your, your great, great grandchildren are going to be able to farm successfully and that the environment that they farm in is, is the same as what you have received from your grandparents. So taking care of the land. Taking care of the land and the planet. There he goes, there he goes.